our congregational praise. The Lord is blessing me right now. The Lord is blessing me right now. Oh, right now. The Lord is blessing me right now. Oh, right now. He woke me up this morning and started me on my way. The Lord is blessing me right now. Now let's sing it like we need it. Welcome to University Baptist Church. We are certainly glad that you all are here. And the Lord is blessing me right now. We can go home on that one. <laughs> no, we're going to be here for a little bit. <laughs> all right. I am so thankful to be here. I hope you are. I hope you had an opportunity to enjoy a week with the good, the bad, the indifference, the emails, the meetings, the Zoom meeting that lasts forever, and all the above. The Lord is blessing me right now. Talk about gratitude. Gratitude is an interesting word. It, it, it just feels good, gratitude. But you know, it's kind of hard to have gratitude if your life is in disarray. It's kind of hard to see what is good in your life when all around you, you seem to be discomfort, people are not certain, family issues. But man, if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's, we certainly need to have gratitude. It's the object that we know that no matter how bad it can be, no matter how bad it is going, we have a God that loves us, wants nothing but the best for us, and will always be there. I'm grateful. I hope you're grateful. As we go through this morning's service, think about what it is to be grateful. I had a group of people used to tell me, if you're not sure about what's going on in your life, take a piece of paper and write down what you're grateful for. What I'm grateful for is two loving parents that were always there. What I'm grateful for the object that I came to University Baptist Church not knowing what was going to happen. <laughs> Look what happened. Find something you can be grateful for. Because what's going to happen during the course of this week, somebody is not going to make you happy. I could use another language, but someone is not going to make you happy. And maybe you can take that piece of paper and look at all the things that you're grateful for, all the things in your life that are meaningful to you. And then you too can say, I'm grateful for a loving God. Welcome to University Baptist Church. We invite you to stand together and uh, sing God Who's Giving Knows No Ending. It's printed on your insert. Skill. 
And now welcome to this time of prayer and thanksgiving. We are thankful for those who can come and be with us in person. It makes such a difference to us who are leading worship to have you and your energy in this space. We are thankful for those who watch online from wherever you are. We pray God's blessing upon you. We want to open this time and remember those in our church who work behind the scenes, and especially those who, deacons, church council, Sunday school teachers, all of those who work to make the church happen and to make God's word in flesh. We pray this afternoon we will have a vision committee meeting and pray for those who are on the committee, those new members as well as returning members. And now let us have a time of silent so that our hearts may be open and called to God's presence. for your gift of music this morning. Thank you for how it makes us feel, how it opens our eyes and our spirit to you. And may it soothe us in those times when we are lonely and in need of a word. May we just hum a hymn or listen to some music to make us feel your presence, make us to feel better, and encourage us to move on in this life. We come to you this morning in awe and gratitude and wonder of this beautiful day and this blessed life that we are living. Some of us are emerging from the deep, dark tunnel in which we've been living, particularly during this pandemic. For some, there has been little, if any, light. For others, the light is getting stronger. Help us to remember that you are the light. Allow us to feel your glow in times of trials and tribulations the happy, the sad, the griefs, and the sorrows, the good, bad, and ugly in this life. We remember and pray for our brothers and sisters in this place who need a special attention from you, who are sick, who are lonely, who are ill, and in need of your grace. 
We pray your special touch upon their lives. We pray for those in this neighborhood, in this state, in this country, and in our world. Send your loving light to those who experience trauma, war, injustice every day. And help us to do the best we can. Help us to do what's right and to be your beautiful creation in this beloved community. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. And now, Lord, help us to say the words that Jesus taught his disciples when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now stand with me as I go back down there and lead you in Count Your Blessings. today next week we are going to have uh, a church business meeting following worship uh, we hope you will come and stay we'll be talking about our budget for 2022 and electing some new members and some wonderful things like that so uh, we'll do it right after worship if you're not coming into worship and you'd like to participate you can do so by zoom but you're going to need to email us that request so if you want to be a part of a Zoom a viewing of our business meeting, email that request to the church office this week, and we'll get you set up. We're now ready for our offertory prayer. I want to let you know you can bring your offering to the front table, but if you wish not, you can. there's a back table where you can drop your offering off. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together. 
We thank you for all the wonderful things you have allowed us to, to do with our lives. And now is the opportunity for us to share some of the goodness with others. As we bring our gifts and offering, we thank you for the opportunity to show others how loving and caring you are. Amen. seated. I love many things about our tradition, but I, I sort of envy a ritual that many other traditions in the Christian faith have, that when they read the gospel, everything stops, and everybody stands up, and sometimes they bring in a cross, and sometimes there's special music, and they ring bells, because they want everybody to know, we are about to hear the words of Jesus Christ. You are about to hear the words of Jesus Christ. If you have a Bible and you want to read along on your phone or in the pew racks or with one you brought, we're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. And we're going to begin with verse 22. And these are the words of life. Luke 12, verse 22. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? If, then, you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? 
Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink. And do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that strive after these things. And your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for God's kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. May God bring these words alive in our heart and souls today. Amen.
falls from my eyes and you stand before me I know you love me oh I know you love me at the cross I Thank Timmy Neolua for that beautiful song today. Pastor Mark, your accompaniment reminds us of the great love that God has for our lives. When the 400 Mazowa gang took 17 Christian missionaries captive in Haiti, they showed where their treasure is. Five of the 17 that they still hold captive are children. Children who will be traumatized for the rest of their lives no matter what happens next. You wonder what you would trade your soul for? Evidently $17 million. They are willing to trade eternal judgment by God for some money in the bank. Jesus would call that a pitifully poor bargain. Last week, Joaquin Romero showed where his treasure is. Joaquin runs a zip line company in Palma Valley, California. And he was helping a woman get in the harness for the zip line. Any of you ever been on a zip line? Okay. He was putting her in the harness. And something happened. I don't know if the wind or the platform was unstable or, or something else happened, but she just started going without the harness fully uh, latched, and he grabbed onto her, and they went out about 40 feet from the platform, and they hang, hung on to each other in the line. But Joaquin Romero knew something that the woman did not know. He knew that that zip line could not hold both of their weight. A decision had to be made, and Joaquin Romero let go of the woman and dropped to his death. Who could do that? Only somebody whose treasure is with God, who knows that he will be honored for all eternity for his act of sacrificial love. Where is your treasure? 
It's a very important question because Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, Princeton and Cambridge New Testament scholar Norvell Gildenheis says heart when Jesus uses it in a Hebrew culture doesn't mean the same thing as when we use it in an English culture. When we talk about heart, we're generally talking about our emotions, love and stuff like that. But in the Hebrew culture, it covers everything. Thoughts, actions, desires, passions, emotions, it's the whole deal. So when Jesus says where your treasure is, there is your heart, he's saying that your heart will direct you to spend all the resources of your life, your intelligence, your, your time, your skill, your talent, it will direct you to spend all the resources of your life on whatever your treasure is. If you after money, you'll spend your life and everything you have trying to get money. If you're after political power, you'll spend all your passions and your ideas, your thoughts, your time trying to get your party in power or yourself in power. If it's personal appearance, you'll spend an inordinate amount of time and money trying to look your best. And if it's God, you'll spend the resources of your life to do the will of God. So what is your treasure? This is the interactive portion of today's sermon. So I'm going to ask some questions. And the first three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Most of you won't. I understand that. But we're going to act like you're going to cooperate. <laughs> those of you playing at home, uh, you can monitor each other on uh, how you vote. And those of us in here, you can monitor each other and see where the treasure is. These are arbitrary questions. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. But here you go, all right? Would you rather spend a month without your car or without your computer? Whether it's a laptop, desktop, whatever it is. All right? If you'd say, I'd rather be without my car than my computer, raise your hand. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, all right, okay. Now, if you'd say, I'd rather go without my computer than my car, okay, all right. You get points for all that. You're doing very well. All right, here's second question. Would you rather spend a month without your cell phone or without your refrigerator? Cell phone, refrigerator. How many of you say, I'd rather spend a month without my cell phone? Yeah, look at you old fogies. Okay. <laughs> How many of you would say, I'd rather go without my refrigerator? I'll eat out. I'll do some dry food. I'll, you know, okay. All right, I'll graze in the backyard. I'll find a way. Okay. Third question. How many of you would rather go without your TV or your spouse? Oh, no, don't answer that one. Don't answer that one. Don't an I'm sorry. That, I don't, there was a misprint. These questions, by the way, are modified from a BuzzFeed article by Rami Patel, who has these questions. The question really is, would you rather spend a month without your TV or without your bed? Your TV or your bed. Okay. How many of you would rather go without your TV but have a bed? Well, most of you. How many of you say, oh, I gotta have my TV, I'll sleep on the floor? Okay. All right. Score, uh, those playing at home, give each other a score here. We're gonna move into the second round. These questions are a little more personal, so don't raise your hand. Would you choose to double the time of your commute for an additional $10,000 in salary. Whatever it takes you to get to work now. Now, this is before COVID. Don't tell me, well, I go down in my basement, so I'll double that. I'm talking about if you had to drive. And if you're retired back when you worked, would you choose to double the time of your commute for $10,000 more a year? Second question. Would you choose to work a job you hated? You hated it every day? for an extra $20,000 a year. You thinking about that? Pondering it? Okay. Would you trade your sense of humor to be better looking? <laughs> ah, to look like some of us, you need a sense of humor, don't you? So, <laughs> would you trade your sense of humor? You know, you'd never be funny again. You'd never see much humor in life, but you'd be a knockout. You'd be handsome as they get. Would you trade your sense of humor to be better looking? 
And would you trade 10 years of your life to be rich and famous? Cover, your face is on the cover of magazines, every restaurant, come on in, people love you, you got lots of money. Would you trade 10 years of your life to be rich and famous? Round three. Now we're going to really go deep. Are you ready? Okay. Would you choose to lose your retirement income or your ability to pray? Would you prefer to see your political party driven into obscurity by a political party you detest or see your church cease to exist? Would you prefer to use $12,000, let's say this is extra income, $12,000 to take a dream vacation with someone you love or to provide rent for a whole year for a single mother and her child in true need? These are harder, aren't they? Would you prefer to have enough wealth to never worry about money again? or to have enough faith in God to never worry about money again. These questions are arbitrary. They're false choices. Nobody's going to tell you you got to take your cell phone or your refrigerator. Uh, you may have enough money to take a dream vacation and help people in need. Uh, nobody's going to say, give me your retirement in income or, or your ability to pray. They're false choices. but. They are meant to cause us to think about where is our treasure? Where is our treasure? For Jesus said where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. You're going to spend everything you have on whatever is your treasure. And Jesus warned us about making the treasure money and all that money can buy. Uh, people tell you know, one another from time to time, I don't care too much for money. Uh, but all the stuff it can buy now, I'll take that. Now, this goes together this morning. If Jesus said, if you make your treasure money and all that it can buy, it's going to cause you to make three false evaluations of very important aspects of your life. Number one, it's going to cause you to give a false evaluation to the power of money. <laughs> You're going to think that money can take care of everything if you just get enough of it. And that is an illusion, a delusion, and it's false. Jesus said, all the money in the world, if you worry about it forever and you get all the money in the world, you can add a single hour to your life. Something as simple as that. Money can't buy you time. What we don't know is, did Jesus mean you can't add a single hour to your life, or did he mean you can't add any life to your hours? We don't know. The words are kind of jumbled, but it's got truth either way. Money can't add time to your life, and it can't add life to your time. And, and we think money's going to secure us with food and, and the stuff we really need, and Jesus says, look at the ravens and, and look at the lilies of the field. They don't work. They don't have any money, and yet they're, they're well taken care of. Uh, yesterday, uh, Karen and I were sleeping in our home in Harper's Ferry, and we heard a knock on the door. At least I thought it was a knock on the door. And then it did again. I thought, this is getting weird. So I said, Karen, go find out who that is. <laughs> Karen said, no, that's not a knock on the door. That's up on the window. The skylight, the windows are knocking on the windows. And I thought, who is up on the window? And she said, go check the window. So I got up, and I'm opening windows and opening it. I think it's in the bathroom now. You go in there, and, uh, go back and, the and then finally she's, ah. And then she gets up, and she goes outside. And it's ravens on the windows, pecking. So she shot them. No, she didn't. She just scared them off. God takes care of even those ravens that are waking me up when I'm not ready to wake up. 
God said, I'll take care of the ravens and the lilies and everything. Uh, I'll take care of you. Don't put your trust in money. Remember, if you put your trust in money, Jesus said that it can rust your valuables. Uh, the moths can eat them. It, your purses can have a hole in them. What he means by that is the things that hold your money can prove to be inconsequential. You can have a downturn in the economy. The stock market can plummet. Inflation can rise. Jesus says, listen, if you put your treasure in money and all that it can buy, you're going to have a false evaluation of money. You're going, to rate, you're going to estimate it too high. But if you put your trust in God, you can spend your life counting your blessing. Secondly, it gives you a false evaluation of people. Jesus said, sell everything you got and give alms to the poor. So that's a better way of pleasing God. You know, take care of those in need around you. Uh, help folks you live a little bit easier life. Use money to, to support people and get people out of crisis. That's what it's for. Uh, but when we put money in all it can buy, we start looking down at other people and we devalue them. You know, I, I've noticed something. When people are employees, they talk about, oh, I don't have enough benefits and my insurance is uncover everything and I'm not making enough money and I deserve more money. But when those same people rise up to management, <laughs> their whole mind changes. And then it's all, well, how do we keep the bottom line and how do we keep you pretty low? No, you're not going to get this. We've got to cut benefits. We've got to cut salary. Got to, uh, I don't think anybody's going to go into heaven. And Jesus says, so, I'm so grateful that you kept the bottom line so well. Nobody could survive working for you, but I, I'm so glad you held true to that. That would be devaluating people. It's not only others we devaluate. If, we, if money is our treasure, we devaluate ourselves. Jesus said, look at the lilies of the field and the ravens of the air. They don't work. They don't get money. Are you not more valuable than they? Isn't that a beautiful question? You mean a lot more to God than any of those? Quit looking down on yourself. Listen to how we talk. We say Jeff Bezos is worth, Bezos is worth a zillion dollars. And I'm not worth a zillion dollars. We evaluate ourselves by money in the bank. Isn't that kind of nutty? Jesus said don't value yourself that way. There is a TV actress by the name of Jamila Jamil. It's kind of a musical name. Uh, and she spends her days now trying to help women to quit evaluating themselves by their weight. Can we get an amen to that? She's on uh, social media, and she shows all these women who feel badly about themselves because they put on a few pounds and they don't feel they're worth as much. And she comes back on and says, listen, you don't value your worth according to your weight. You value it according to your love. According to your love. According to your compassion according to the contributions you make in this world, to the way you make this world a better place. When we put our treasure in money and all that it can buy, fashion and all the stuff that we can buy, and Jamila Jamil says the people make millions on the internet selling diet plans and teas you drink and surgeries to make you look supposedly better. It's so sad that that's where our worth is, and Jesus said that's what happens when you put your treasure and money, you devalue yourself. And lastly, he says you devalue God. He says, look, the nations of the world, they worry about all this stuff, but you shouldn't. The nations of the world are the non-Jewish people, the Gentile nations. And I, it's important to note that they were very religious people. Remember when Paul goes to Athens and he, he says, you know, I've been wandering around your city. You've got an idol to every god in the world. You've got a god for everything in this culture. You even have an idol to the, remember what he said, the, the unknown god. Gods you haven't even discovered yet. You are very religious people. That's what Paul said. But you're just worshiping the wrong god. And Jesus says, when you act like the nations of the world, maybe you've got to make money your treasure. But when you truly understand God, our God, my God, your God, you realize that it is our God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. That our God wants to provide us with food and shelter and the needs of life. That our God is going to be with us forever. That nothing can separate us from God. 
Jesus says, when you put your treasure in money, you're worried about money or appearance or uh, the bottom line, or you're worried about uh, not getting any help from God. But when you put your full trust in God, you can live your life counting your blessings. My granddaughter uh, went trick-or-treating for the first time last Sunday. She's three years old. And there was a lot of buzz and build-up to this event. Uh, she has lots of people that love her, and they were all telling her, oh, we're going to go with you, and we're going to dress up, and you're going to go door-to-door and get all the candy you can uh, imagine, and here's a big bucket. You're going to carry that around. They're just going to fill it up with candy. And, and so the big day came, and it took hours of preparation. She went as Elsa and had to get whoever that is, all dressed up. And, and now, you know, the adults, you know, adults today, they got to dress up too. And so they all dressed up. And so, uh, you know, the big night came and everybody was ready and out they go. And they took her over to an upscale part of New Orleans where it is known for their generous candy. And so she went and she rang the doorbell and the lady came out and with two fistfuls of candy and the lady dropped them all into her bucket. And my granddaughter looked down at that bucket, and she started pulling things out of there. And she'd give them back to the lady. <laughs> she said, I only like chocolate. I won't eat the rest of this stuff. <laughs> give it to some other kid. And the lady said, no, I want you to have it. She said, no, no, give it to some other kid. I don't need this. <laughs> so as she walked on, her father said, now, you've got to be kinder. That's kind of rude when people give you something. She goes, I'm not going to eat it. Why would I take it? Somebody else might want it. She went to the next house, rang the doorbell, and they gave her a blow pop. Do you know what a blow pop is? Yeah. It was very colorful, and so she liked it. And even though it wasn't chocolate, she put it in a bucket. She went to the third house and rang the doorbell, and the lady came with another blow pop. And she said, no, thank you. I already got one. Then she turned around and she walked back down the little sidewalk. She went up to all those people that loved her and said, I'm ready to go home now. I've got what I need. And they said, oh, no, we're going to spend a lot more time. All these houses have candy and it's going to be great and uh, see the other children. She goes, no, what I'd really like to do is go home with my daddy. And she went home with all those people that loved her counting her blessings. Something like that is what Jesus is trying to teach us. We don't need all this stuff. And if our treasure really is in money and what it can buy, we're going to devaluate God. We're going to devaluate ourselves. We're going to over-evaluate money. We're going to live a life that is worried and anxious and counting our pennies and denying others what, what they need. It's going to be a long and hard life. But if we can put our treasure in God and doing the will of God, we can go home with God, we can go out with God, we can be with God in this domain and God the next domain. And through it all, we can spend our time counting our blessings. Amen. I'd like for you to turn in your bulletin and read with me our confession and assurance of pardon. Let us read it together. Lord, help us to see the full treasure of your blessings in our lives and live with gratitude. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn before communion, and um, I don't know this hymn. Cheryl, do you know it? Oh. Know it. Oh, oh, she knows it now. All right. Where your treasure is, let's take it and stand together. Oh! 
this morning. It is our indeed privilege to take communion together. You can see the communion elements are here, both the cup and the wafer. And we invite you to come uh, and take this. We're going to invite you today to come from this direction and then kind of go this way. We'll try to make some kind of a pattern so we're not running into each other. And we can each take the communion. I'd like for you to come and take the cup and then go back to where you are. And then I will read the scriptures and we will take the wafer and the cup together. You understand? So you come and get it, go back, and then I'll read the scripture and we'll take the wafer and the cup. Let's begin with prayer, though. Oh God, we cannot fully uh, value and evaluate the treasure that you are to our lives, the ability to pray, the assurance of forgiveness, the constant presence, the deliverance here and a home in heaven, the joy that you can put in our heart, the faith, the grace, all these things are a bountiful treasure beyond our full comprehension. And for what Jesus did for us, this act of sacrificial love at the cross to set us free from all of our burdens and to fill us with your Holy Spirit. We cannot say thank you enough. We enter in communion with that living Christ who is with us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As Pastor Mark plays, I invite you to come and to get the elements for the communion service. The Apostle Paul said these words, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We take this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Let us take this as we proclaim all that Christ has done for us. Pastor Kenny will come and give a blessing to our children and then we will sing our benediction. We want to let all the children know and the adults know treasures are wonderful things. But the biggest treasure we will ever have is the relationship with a loving God. As you grow older, know that whatever is going on, that is one treasure will never go be broken. It's never going to be unimportant. It is the thing that will always sustain you, a loving, caring God. Amen. Thank you.